Hi, this is Tom Rhodes. Please join me as I scour the four corners of the earth to bring you interesting and intelligent, funny people who will enrich your life with wisdom and laughter. I'll take you to Europe, Australia, all over America. I might take you to the peaks of Machu Picchu, the canals of Amsterdam, the Great Wall of China, or the swamps of Florida, and certainly the many, many comedy clubs and comedy theaters all over the world. Come hang out with me and meet the many interesting people that pop up in my life as I travel the world as a stand-up comedian. You're listening to Tom Rhodes Radio. Karate kick, baby. Rock and roll. Tommy, Tommy, Tommy. Ashna, Ashna, Ashna. Hey, welcome to Tom Rhodes Radio Smart Camp. Beep, beep. Beep, 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 beep. That is a message coming in of breaking news. Today was a really big day in human history. The high school students walked out to demand um, a change in our gun laws. Yes. I thought, uh, yeah, I'll never talk shit about youngsters Ever again. Ever again. Why? Well, I guess these aren't millennials. These are the next generation after the millennials. What are we? Mm. What are we calling them? Oh, I actually knew that. The law changers. <laughs> I love it. Let's call it. You know the make censors. <laughs> the what? <laughs> <laughs> make censors. Make censors. I like that. <laughs> the uh, the common censors. The balance. The balancers. You know, you set up uh, yesterday. I did. Uh, one of the mentoring sessions where um, s- someone can pay and, and, and talk to me for an hour on Skype, these mentor sessions. Just hanging out with and so Tom. I've done three of them so far. I thought it was a really weird idea when you first, I mean, not weird. I was just like, oh, brother, how's this going to go? And uh, all three have been excellent. And so I'm talking to this wonderful guy yesterday. I won't give away his name, but... He grew up in Louisiana, and now he lives in Colorado, not far from the um, the Four Points, where I took you to that. Well, you don't have to say where he grew up. No, but it's he, he lives in this really cool area, yeah. and so the thing he wanted to talk about was like motivating his kids. Yeah. And, and, and I talked to him for a long time, and, you know, he's just having a hard time motivating his kids. And uh, the, he wrote me back today an email thanking me for the conversation. And he said that after our conversation, he basically realized that his kids are spoiled. Oh, no shit. Yeah. And so I thought about it. This guy's life is a victory. I mean, he created it. He wanted to create a life for his kids that were better than the life he had growing up in Louisiana. And he lives in this like really cool part of Colorado, not yeah. far from those cave ruins, those Native American cave dwellings that I took you to. Oh, I loved it. That Everybody was, should go. Wasn't that one of the coolest trips we ever took? Yeah, it was. It was very romantic too because the stone has this uh, reddish, orangey color. And um, just just driving through that is very romantic just because of the color, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I thought it was cool that he... It's like the meep, meep, shoo, shoo. The... Meep, meep. <laughs> <laughs> it's driving through, through that the ro- it was like the Roadrunner cartoon. The Roadrunner cartoon. Yeah, because yeah. you can actually see those little birds. Like when you go through Arizona and Utah. Those, yeah, really? Yeah, they're really <laughs> tiny. They don't look like um, the Roadrunner cartoons. Meep, meep. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I thought it was cool that um, this guy's created such a life for his kids that, you know, they, um, they're comfortable, basically. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm very impressed with this. Young generations coming up, and you remember the smart. You remember the all the footage from the '60s of like college bearded, long haired college hippies demanding an end to the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Now it's these like fresh faced high school kids who are demanding gun laws. And we're tired of of capitalism and tired of of uh, companies who are not doing the good thing for society. Did you know a a big portion of um, People who are getting a new job, asking for a new job, find it very important that the company they will work with um, is more, you know, environment friendly, society friendly. They really care for that. 
you know, next to the, the salary they're getting, they find it equally important. Right. The, the, the corporation they work for has a conscience. Yes. Moral, our moral companies. And that says a lot about these millennials or youngsters. Yeah. Whatever comes after millennials. The, the balancers. The balancers. I like that. I don't know if you saw this one speech this kid got up and made today in front of the Capitol. He said, uh, you politicians that don't want to, that want to stay with the NRA and don't want to change. We've got our eye on you and we're going to vote you out of office. And like this kid's like probably 16 and he's standing there all like confident and big dick rock and roll. <laughs> and uh, forever people have been afraid of the NRA and standing up to these uh, politicians who are in the pocket of the NRA. And I just thought it was really ballsy and cool to see this little 16-year-old kid and all these other kids giving these speeches going, we're not afraid of you, fuckers. I love that. It's so idealistic. But they're, they're doing it, you know. They're not just dreamers. They just do it. They go there and they speak. They're not afraid, you know. I mean, a lot of the way I grew up was I really had to respect elder people. And then, you know, you always talk a little bit reserved, you know. Um, actually, I think if this would happen, if I would be in that class with my um, history, I would, would write a formal letter and try to convince them, <laughs> right, you know. Right, right. And they're just talking like they're equals. And I liked it about the youngsters. They do because, I don't know, you know, this is about a lot of reasons, but they don't have that huge gap between uh, the generation, you know. They, they just talk like you or anybody else, you know, you did, like you're a friend, like, hey man, how are you? You know, I wouldn't say that to an older guy. I would say, uh, oh, hello, you know, <laughs> more formal, right? Yeah. And the, these youngsters are pre just really cool about that. Hey, man, how are you? Like your jacket, you know? So them just just yelling emotionally and, you know, rightfully what, what they are bothered with was so great to see. Yeah, and it's amazing if you think about it, that Stoneman Douglas high school shooting happened one month ago. So these kids have organized all of this uh, protest and, you know, school walkout. And next week is that march for our lives on march 24th and all this has happened in the space of a month yeah so these kids are really kicking ass i hope that the politicians are not gonna now say well we're gonna we're gonna um up up the voting age <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna change the voting age to 35 yeah so these kids uh won't have any power for another 10 years but you know as, as fucked up as the world looked a year ago you have to admit like some seems like some really beautiful changes are happening in society now like gun laws and um the women's movement and uh the demand for diversity mm -hmm. in entertainment you know my my manager keeps telling me it's not a good time to be a white guy mm -hmm. and uh the film and television is looking for diversity and i keep telling my manager that he's looking at this wrong. Because in all these stories of diversity, they're gonna need a white guy to kill. Mm -hmm. And I wanna be that white guy. So I've been practicing getting killed. So I can have a career in entertainment. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I think you said it in the last podcast too. Shit, did I really? Maybe, yeah. Wow, and we, we lost, uh, pretty shocking, I, I know that you probably, uh, you've heard me play the song for you. It's one of my favorite songs, but Craig Mack died yesterday. Craig Mack, uh, one hit wonder. He had the song, I'm kicking new flavor in your ear. I'm kicking new flavor in your ear. I'm going to fit inside your mouth like a piece of sizzling. I always liked that he used the word sizzling, which is like some cheap processed bacon. <laughs> And then uh, Stephen Hawking died today. Yeah. You're a science lover. That was a hard one. Yeah. Genius mind, yeah. You know, his first wife divorced him because uh, she claimed domestic violence, that he had abused her. So he must have a pretty fast wheelchair. <sighs> 
You remember that joke that I used to do about Stephen Hawking? Mm -hmm. I got the worst birthday present this year. I got a Stephen Hawking audiobook read by the author. It's supposed to be about the cosmos, but I can't understand a word of it. Billions and billions of years ago. <laughs> okay, are you done, Mr. Martin Class? <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to bust out a couple of jokes. <laughs> This are the perils of doing a podcast with a comedian. This is what it's like to live. <laughs> this is what it's like to live with a comedian. <laughs> so, okay. We should, do, we should do an episode about that. Speaking of death, why don't we talk about this movie that we went to see last night? Uh, the Death the of Stalin. <laughs> now, well, first of all, what did you think about the Arclight Cinema on oh, what a cool cinema. Sunset Boulevard? Yeah, because from the outside, it looks like this... Um, alien spaceship because it has this round thing around a it. A dome. A dome, yeah. But when you go in, it's super big. And it has like um, the the board where all the movies are described on, written on. It's very beautiful because it goes a little bit curved. It almost looks like a train station. Yeah. Uh, the board for the movies. Yeah. And instead of the destinations, it is they're like movie titles. Yeah, and they have a bar, a full bar. It's really cool. I like it. I have not been to the Arclight in probably 12 years. And I told you there was a very funny story that happened to me. So you saw that there's a beautiful, uh, it, it's almost like a train station when you go inside with the, the electronic board with all the movies. And then you saw the, the bar area over on the right side, yeah. it, like a full bar. So when I was living in LA 12 years ago, I had not seen my friend Mike Brennan who, this is a guy that I started doing open mic nights with in Orlando. And he's lived in L.A. for years. I hadn't seen him in years. And I was supposed to meet him there uh, to, to go to a movie. Uh -huh. And I hadn't seen him in years. And I, he, I see him walk in, and then he's walking. And I swear to God, this is true. Keanu Reeves walks in. And he's got his motorcycle helmet in his hand, and he's got his motorcycle jacket. And uh, my friend Mike Brennan is walking right behind Keanu Reeves, and Keanu Reeves is walking into the bar area. And like, I got this really happy face, and I waved. And I know Keanu Reeves thought I was probably happy and waving at him, but uh, I went, "Hey, Mike!" And my enthusiasm was not for Keanu; it was for my for my friend. I love Keanu Reeves. Who doesn't? Um, so let's talk about this movie. First of all, there was a lot of pressure going into this movie because our friend Lucy Pohl loved it. And she talked about this friend of hers who saw it and didn't like it. And she, <laughs> and she said, I don't know if I can be friends with that guy anymore because he didn't like it. You know? Well, I told you that, I told you that after the movie, right? Yeah. Yeah. But you wanted to see it so bad. And, you know, we have a movie pass uh, because movie watching for us is research. And we have got this movie pass, but uh, the Arclight is not affiliated with it. So um, we had to pay full price. So we had to pay full price. And I thought this is only the last day that Tom and I can see it together. So we really busted our asses. And, you know, we thought, okay, we got to see this movie um, last night. You know, we got to put the time out to see this movie. So we went to it and you know, the art line is amazing. It was a great experience. We're sitting there and then after two minutes we get popcorn and wine, like, oh yeah, this is gonna be a great night, you know? And then the movie starts, uh, how did it start again? Uh, there's a radio station having a classical music okay, yeah. concert. And it was super funny, but here it is. There's this guy behind us. <laughs> and I am really enjoying the first few minutes of the movie. It's hilarious. I can immediately sense the satire in it. I can immediately sense that absurdism in it. But this guy behind me is laughing every one or two seconds. Super loud that it, it, it started to annoy me so bad that I thought, wait a minute. You really have to laugh about this. You know? It was almost like he was paid by the producers of the movie to be sitting in the theater and laughing his head off or something. Don't you hate when people in the movie theater laugh only because they want to uh, want to show their opinion? 
Cause, because you're a loud laugher in the movie theater when you want to show other people like, haha, I found this really funny. And then you, you even um, laugh harder than you would have. It's a social thing. So he was doing that. You know? But I, I liked the laughter in the movie, you know, and I and it, it made me think about different great comedies I had seen in theaters and and the laughs. It was just this one guy who was sitting directly behind us was laughing like a jackal, and and that was a little distracting. It was distracting because then it made me think, wait a minute, this was not that funny, you know. So it kind of affected me, affected the way that I I saw the rest of the movie because he just kept laughing even. Even at the, there's a few moments in the story that are a little bit, um, because of, of the reality, because the death of Stalin is about the death of Stalin. And of course, you know, it's a terrible time in reality, you know, I'm sorry, in, in history. And there are a few moments that I thought, wow, yeah, that's really bad because that actually really happened, you know. And then the guy laughed at that shit too. I was really like, "Oh my god, please remove this dude." I really liked the movie. I thought it was funny. And in, in, in uh, you know, you 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 said and you correctly that you know, some of the jokes fell flat. Like at the beginning, Stalin's body's there and he's like in this piss and then like these guys kneel down in it. And I mean, it it it, it was No, well, the, I don't I think there were two jokes that fell flat. One is they have a lot of flowers at the funeral. Yeah. And then somebody is coughing and says, oh, oh, oh this, this pollen uh, allergy. And I know that everything in the movie has some kind of meaning. And so that was clearly a joke. To, yeah. To put in the movie for a joke. And I thought, wow, that's such an open mic night. Yeah. Like, a, like when the guy Baria goes, uh, I'll get all of you. And then the Jeffrey Tamb- Tambor character goes, he said, all of you. I was standing over there. He wasn't talking about me. He, he went like this with his hand. Like, I, I, I mean, you know. I thought it was funny. I thought it was funny. Uh, I, mean, I, I saw the humor in it. I, I, I thought it went on for a second too long. I thought the movie was funny. There were great parts in it. It's great. Um, I mean, the, the, the satire of the real situation is funny enough on its own of the, you know, what boobs these people were and i'm sure this movie will piss off putin and everyone in russia who sees it but uh it's hard to get past the fact that they're constantly shooting people and torturing people and then the the baria that guy he like you know rapes this yeah i thought those moments were not funny so it's 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 hard to like laugh at kind of silly gags when there's people constantly getting shot and tortured and, and raped and raped young young girls and th- and that's what I mean I, I didn't think those were funny and I don't think that it was it was meant to be funny but this guy was laughing at that shit too so it really annoyed me as well you know this guy really ruined my movie experience because I thought the movie is is interesting um, you have to know a little bit of the history to really find this movie to understand the the humor in this movie because when you know the whole history how Stalin died you know what happened uh what his daughter said you know if you know about his son a little bit you find everything super hilarious because it's based on reality yeah it actually happened and when you see it you think holy shit it is I'm watching a comedy oh no this is not a comedy this really happened and then you just burst out laughing, you know, because then, because you see it exactly filmed <laughs> um, from straight from reality. And I told you, it's the same thing, for example, let's say in 10 years, somebody would make a movie out of uh, the Trump and the Trump, the President Trump and the Trump administration. Yeah. Him saying particular things, things, things happening in the administration. Literally the truth, right? And they would make the movie exactly like how, how it happened. It would be a satire. It would be absurdism. But it's funny because it actually happened. And you're watching the movie and thinking, I cannot believe that this guy really said that. He tweeted that at 3 a.m.? That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, it's interesting because I went to Tbilisi, Georgia years ago, like 20 years ago. And, you know, Joseph Stalin was from Georgia. So... 
you know, he was a you know ruthless dictator, murdered hundreds of thousands of people. But in Georgia, they think he was a swell guy. Like, Propaganda. I remember they had uh, vodka with Stalin's picture on it. Like every, they were selling everything with Joseph Stalin's face on it in Georgia. He's like their Mickey Mouse. You know. I knew that he uh, loved Western, and. Uh, oh, I didn't know that. And that the the son uh, lost a whole uh, group of. Uh, National Olympic or something hockey players. Oh yeah, they like yeah. the the there was a plane crash yeah. with their hockey team, the national hockey team. Wow, uh, it was a good movie. I I enjoyed it. I I thought it was uh, it was funny at times. I think Steve Buscemi was amazing. It was so funny. Buscemi's fantastic as um, uh, Nikita. Nikita. Scratch <laughs> Scratchy, scratchy. <laughs> scratchy, scratchy. Uh, not, um, Jesus. I, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. He famously, uh, at the UN, he like banged his shoe on the table. Shushkov. Shushkov. Uh, no, Nik- Khrushchev. That's Khrushchev. It. Nikita Khrushchev. That is, that's, how yeah. I, that's what I said all along. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was saying. So, um, are you ready for the game? Yes, let's explain what our game is. So, Ashna and I invented this game. We invented this game all by ourselves. We have this apartment for the last three years, and we have eight um, very tall bookcases. How many books do you think this is? I'd say 2,000. Maybe it's more. Maybe it's... What do you think? 2,000? I'd say there's 2,000 books here, don't you think? Uh, no. Oh no. Okay. Well, we're I gonna... think I think two three hundred per per per, per bookcase. Okay. okay. So three six nine twelve fifteen eighteen twenty two twenty five. So two thousand five hundred books. Okay. And then you forget that bookcase. Oh, and then the little stubby half one. Okay, which... you might be right. Anyways, so so we got two thousand like. 2,650. And when people come in, they sometimes ask, oh my God, did you read all of it? And we always think it's a funny question because when you're not a book buyer, <laughs> a, a reader, um, you don't know that sometimes you just buy books for particular memories or particular dreams you have or ideas you have at the moment say for example i'm super interested in philosophy then i buy a lot of philosophy books at that moment doesn't mean i'm going to read all of it yeah know? i mean I, th- I think it's i don't know 50 50 percent like yeah. all those those beautiful books i got when my dad died he was this belonged to this book a month club thing i remember once a month these beautiful leather bound books with gold leaf pages would arrive um i haven't read i've only read one of those but um, anyway, but still 50% of all these books is a lot. Yes, and it's very difficult. This is my okay. lifetime of, of, of reading and collecting yeah. books. So we're, we're almost there, people. <laughs> we're trying to explain. So <laughs> the thing is, there's so many books. So And uh, sometimes we're kind of curious. Like, oh, I wish I have time to read all of these books. So we came up with this game when we have date night. We have date night once a week. Then we just pick out a book and we read a little tiny ex- excerpt. We'll randomly grab a book. I mean, if you know, we'll, we'll see a title we like. We'll just randomly grab a book and we'll read a paragraph or two. Or if it's a book that I read, I always highlight my uh, books that I've, I've read. So, we just do it random. So if, if it's a book I read, we'll just I'll open it and then read like a highlight that I made whenever I read it. So we do it every now and then, and and we had our friend Lucy Pohl over for dinner the other night, and uh, we played the game with her. Yes, and then she will say, oh, this is my favorite book, and then she will look it up, and then she will say her expert. And she um, introduced me to the such a great poet. His name is W.H. Auden. And I just, I just, I'm so in love with him right now that I'm looking forward to reading all his poems. And that's because, you know, of Lucy reading, reading a few of his poems. Yeah, I was unfamiliar with him. 
So, uh, are you ready to kick some new flavor in their ear? We have to definitely start this book roulette. You're calling it book roulette? We're going to call this book roulette. We definitely should shoot this book roulette off with the best beginning ever okay. of a book. Oh, Oh, you oh you want me to read the beginning of Shantaram? Yeah. Oh my god. Okay. Wow. It's over there. Okay. This is the opening paragraph of Shantaram by Gregory David David Roberts. I would put this in my top three favorite books of all time. And I think personally that this is the greatest opening paragraph of any book ever written. Okay. You ready? Here we go. It took me a long time and most of the world to learn what I know about love and fate and the choices we make. But the heart of it came to me in an instant, while I was chained to a wall and being tortured. I realized, somehow, through the screaming in my mind, that even in that shackled, bloody helplessness, I was still free. Free to hate the men who were torturing me or to forgive them. It doesn't sound like much, I know, but in the flinch and bite of the chain, when it's all you've got, that freedom is a universe of possibility. And the choice you make between hating and forgiving can become the story of your life. Wow. wow. Ain't that a motherfucker. Way to knock it out of the park, Greg. You ready? Yeah, lay it on me. The ID that I could be satisfied with her body only was the most humiliating one for her. I'd give you more than any woman could offer, she seemed to say. If only you looked at me, if only you saw me, the real me. She knew only too well that I looked beyond her, that the dislocation between our centers was far more real far more dangerous now than it ever has been. She knew too, there was no other way of reaching me than through the body. This is Henry Miller, Sexus. That's one of my favorite books of all time. Henry Miller wrote the Rosie, Rosie Crucifixion Trilogy. It's three books, it's one story, and it's... Nexus, Plexus, and Sexus. Uh, it's called the Rosie Crucifixion Trilogy. And Sexus is my personal favorite Henry Miller book of all time. Okay, so my turn. Yeah. Within these limitations, the pursuit of culture, even through books, is valuable. Because our happiness depends on what we have in our heads rather than on what we have in our pockets. Even fame is folly. Other people's heads are a wretched place to be the home of a man's true happiness. This is from The Story of Philosophy by Will Durant. Wow. This is one of the books that you and I uh, bonded over. When you and I first started dating, you gave me this book. This is, this is your book. Oh, nice. Do you remember this? Yes, I bought it uh, when I was doing uh, my internship here in California. And you said this was a book you really loved, and you lent it to me. Yeah, I did. And I thought, fuck, I have to marry this woman so I can keep this book. No, you did. You never read it. <laughs> I did. What do you think all these highlights are? Here, how about I read another starred highlight? What do you think? Buddhism is profounder than Christianity because it makes the destruction of the will the entirety of the religion and preaches nirvana as the goal of all personal development. The Hindus were deeper than the thinkers of Europe because their interpretation of the world was internal and intuitive, not external and intellectual. The intellect divides everything. Intuition unites everything. The Hindus saw that the I is a delusion, that the individual is merely phenomenal, and that the only reality is the infinite one. That art thou, whoever is able to say 
this to himself with regard to every being with whom he comes in contact. Whoever is clear-eyed and clear-souled enough to see that we are all members of one organism, all of us little currents in an ocean of will, he is certain of all virtue and blessedness and is one is on the direct road to salvation. Thanks, Will Durant. Actually, I think it, so. These it's all about different philosophers. Each chapter is a different philosopher, and that was Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer. <laughs> Way to go, Schopy. <laughs> Hauer. You ready for the next one? Yeah, lay it on me. Okay. It's called "Moving Towards the Twenty First Century." It's a poem. It was a New Year's Eve party at my place, I think. I was standing holding a drink when this slender young fellow walked up. He was a bit drunk, he said. Hank, I met a woman who said she was married to you for two years. Really? What was her name? Lola Edwards. Never heard of her. Ah, come on, man, she said. Don't know her, baby. In fact, I didn't know who he was. <laughs> I drained my drink, walked to the kitchen, poured a refill. I looked around. Yes, I was at my place. I recognized the kitchen. Another happy new year. Jesus. I walked out to face the people. <laughs> nice. And now, well, one guess who this is. Charles Bukowski. Charles Bukowski. Cool. Why don't you give us Mr. another... Mr. Positivity. <laughs> Why don't you give us another Bukowski poem? Okay, another one. Random, people. Random. This is not our choice. It's random. Pull it out. I now feel like drinking because he was always drinking wine. Yeah. It's called The Writer. When I think of those things I endured trying to be a writer, all those rooms in all those cities nibbling on tiny bits of food that wouldn't keep a rat alive. I was so thin I could slice bread with my shoulder blades, only I seldom had bread. <laughs> Meanwhile, writing things down again and again on pieces on paper. And when I moved from one place to another, my cardboard suitcase was just that, paper outside stuffed with paper inside. Each new landlady would ask, what do you do? I'm a writer. Ah. Oh. As I settled into tiny rooms to evoke my craft, many of them pitied me, gave me little titbits like apples, walnuts, peaches. Little did they know that that was all about that I ate. But their pity ended when they found cheap wine bottles in my place. It's all right to be a starving writer, but not a starving writer who drinks. Drunks are never forgiving anything. But when the world is closing in very fast, a bottle of wine seems a very reasonable friend. Ah, all those landladies, most of them heavy, slow, their husbands long dead. I can sti still see those dares climbing up and down the stairways of their world. They ruled my very existence, without them allowing me an extra week on the rent. Now and then, I was out on the street. And I couldn't write on the street. It was very important to have a room, a door, those walls. Oh, those dark mornings in those beds, listening to their footsteps, listening to them cough, hearing the flushing of their toilets, smelling the cooking of their food, while waiting for some word on my submissions to New York City and the world. My submissions to those educated, intelligent, snobbish, inbred, formal, comfortable people out there. They truly took their time to say no. Yes, in those dark beds with the landladies rustling about, puttering and snooping, sharpening utensils. I often thought of those editors and publishers out there who didn't recognize what I was trying to say 
in my special way. And I thought, they must be wrong. Then this would be followed with a thought much worse than that. I could be a fool. Almost every writer thinks they are doing exceptional work. That's normal. Being a fool is normal. And then I would go out of bed, find a piece of paper and start writing again. Wow. Wow. I love this one. <laughs> Way to go, Chuck. No, this one is good. I love it. That's from The Last Night of the Earth Poems. The Last Night of the Earth Poems. Great book. What a great title. Man, I haven't read Bukowski in years. You sure you don't want to name a child Chuck? No. Why? Why? His name is Chuck? No, well, you call someone named Charles Chuck for short. Why? Because it doesn't even resemble it. You don't say Charlie or Charles. Why is Chuck? Is yeah, you can be Charlie with Charles, but um, anyway. That's weird. That's like, hey, Ashna <laughs> is short for... Um, Susan. Yeah, <laughs> Susan. <laughs> okay, let me take out my contact. This is fun. I love Charles Bukowski. Me too. Okay, so you, this author perfectly follows Charles Bukowski because this guy was Charles Bukowski's hero. Okay, you ready? Yeah. We went for a ride. She asked if I knew anything about guns. I didn't. We drove to a shooting gallery on Main Street. She was an expert shot. She knew the proprietor, a kid in a leather jacket. I couldn't hit anything, not even the big target in the middle. It was her money, and she was disgusted with me. She could hold a revolver under her armpit and hit the bullseye of the big target. I took about 50 shots and missed every time. Then she tried to show me how to hold the gun. I jerked it away from her, flung the barrel recklessly in all directions. The kid in the leather jacket ducked under the counter. Be careful, he yelled. Look out! Her disgust became humiliation. She dug a 50-cent piece out of her pocket full of tips. Try again, she said. And this time don't miss, or I won't pay for it. I didn't have any money with me. I put the gun down on the counter and refused to shoot again. To hell with it, I said. He's a sissy, Tim, she said. All he can do is write poetry. Tim obviously liked only people who knew how to shoot a gun. He looked at me with disgust, saying nothing. I picked up a re repeating Winchester rifle, took aim, and started pumping lead. The big target, 60 feet away, three feet above the ground on a post, showed no sign of being hit. A bell was supposed to ring when the bullseye was hit. Not a sound. I emptied the gun, sniffed the, sniffed the tart stench of powder, and made a face. Tim and Camilla laughed at the sissy, but now a crowd had gathered on the sidewalk. They all shared Camilla's disgust, for it was a contagious thing. And I felt it too. She turned, saw the crowd, and blushed. She was ashamed of me, annoyed, mortified. Out of the side of her mouth, she whispered to me that we should leave. She broke through the crowd, walking fast, six feet ahead of me. I followed leisurely. Ho, ho, and what did I care if I couldn't shoot a damn gun? And what do I care if those mugs had laughed and that she laughed? For which one of them, the boobish swine, the lousy, grinning Main Street dopes, which one of them could compose a story like the Long Lost Hills? Not one of them. And so to hell with their scorn. <laughs> I love that. This is one of my favorite books of all time. This is Ask the Dust by John Fonte. And Charles Bukowski writes the introduction to this book. Yeah. And I remember the introduction where he says... He was like homeless living in L.A. and he would go to the library every day and read books. And all the authors he read, he, he said they all fell flat. None of them had balls or, um, you know, anything real powerful to say. And then he he pulled John Fonte's Ask the Dust off the shelf and and uh, the words grabbed him. I love that the, the piece <clears> he wrote. 
I was just, it something that you highlighted? No, uh, actually, uh, I realized that I didn't have my original copy of Ask the Dust, which is, I think it's, who put it out? Anyway, uh, see all my other, the Bukowski books and the John Fonte books are all the same publisher, There's the same kind of books. Yeah. And see, this one's different. Uh, I realized when we moved in that I did not have a copy of this book, so oh. I um, I ordered it. You ordered it? Okay. Yeah, but it's not, I don't have my original copy where I highlighted it. Okay. Okay. I loved it. Thank you. I like book roulette. You ready for the next one? Yeah. That's the bar in the roulette. <laughs> <laughs> The Don held up his hand. No, don't speak. You found America a paradise. You had a good trade. You made a good living. You thought the world a harmless place where you could take off your pleasure as you willed. You never armed yourself with true friends. After all, the police got at you. There were courts of law. You and yours could come to no harm. You did not need Don Corleone. Very well. My feelings were wounded, but I am not that sort of person who trusts his friendship on those who do not value it. On those who think me of little account. The Don paused and gave the undertaker a polite, ironic smile. Now you come to me and say, Don Corleone, give me justice. And you do not ask with respect. You do not offer me your friendship. You come into my home on the bridal day of my daughter and you ask me to murder and you say, here's a dawn voice became a scornful mimicry. I will pay you anything. No, no, I'm not offended. But why, what have I ever done to make you treat me so disrespectfully? Bonacera cried out in his anguish and his fear. America has been good to me. I wanted to be a good citizen. I wanted my child to be American. The Don clapped his hands together with decisive approval. Well spoken. Very fine. Then you have nothing to complain about. The judge has ruled. America has ruled. Bring your daughter flowers and a box of candy when you go visit her in the hospital. That will comfort her. Be content. After all, this is not a serious affair. The boys were young, high-spirited, and one of them is the son of a powerful politician. No, my dear Amerigo, you have always been honest. I must admit, thought you spurned my friendship, that I would trust the given word of Amerigo Bonacera more than I would any other man's. So give me your word that you will put aside this madness. It's not American. Forgive Forget, life is full of misfortunes. Well, that is from The Godfather from Mario Puzo. That the is classic a, bestseller. That is a great book. I love the Godfather movies so much. I I I got that book. I I forget. I was, I think I bought that in Asia. I might have bought that in Hong Kong. Like you what? did because there was a ticket. Oh, there's a there's a plane ticket in there. I used for a a um a bookmark. What's the plane ticket? It's a um, ticket issue. What is it? Oh, this is great. Yeah, wow, this is, wow, look at this, a, a paper itinerary from a travel agency. This is probably the, look at that, oh, my ticket stub from Cafe Pacific was on there. Okay, wow. So, oh, this is interesting. Los Angeles to Hong Kong, September 12th, arrived September 13th. What year is that? It doesn't say the year, does it? 2007. Wow. It's Asian. And then Hong Kong to Manila on Friday, September 21st. Manila to Bangkok, September 25th. Bangkok to Hong Kong, Hong Kong back to Los Angeles. Wow, yeah, that was the um, the old Hong Kong tour I used to do. How does uh, Marlo Brando does his voice? He, he kind of talks like this. You come to me, 
You asked me for this favor. He put cotton balls in his mouth. Well remember? spoken. Very fine. Then you have nothing to complain about. How do you do that accent? Because in the book he had been shot, like in the throat. And so he had like... Uh, Can you do the accent? No, it's Don Corleone. The judge has ruled. America has ruled. Bring your daughter flowers and a box of candy. <laughs> Is that how you do it? Yeah, so I read that book when I was doing that Asia tour. It was great, man. I love that friggin' book. Okay, wow. You ready for this? I'm ready for it. Okay, I want to read a couple things from this. This is such a... That's not fair. That's not book roulette. I had never been too political, but I knew how white people treated black people. And it was hard for me to come back to the bullshit white people put a black person through in this country. To realize you don't have any power to make things different is a bitch. In Paris, shit. Whatever we played over there, right or wrong, was cheered, was accepted. That ain't good either. But that's the way it was. And we came back over here and couldn't even find no work. International stars and couldn't get jobs. White musicians who were copying my birth of the cool thing, were getting the jobs. Man, that shit hurt me to the quick. We got a few gigs here and there, and I think we rehearsed an 18-piece band that summer. But that was it. I was only 23 years old in 1949, and I guess I expected more. I lost my sense of discipline, lost my sense of control over my life, and started to drift. It wasn't like I didn't know what was happening to me. I did. But I didn't care anymore. I had such confidence in myself that even when I was losing control, I really felt I had everything under control. But your mind can play tricks on you. I guess when I started to hang like I did, it surprised a lot of people who thought I had it all together. It also surprised me how fast I eventually lost control. This don't, don't say who it is. No, nope. go, go further. Okay, read a couple more. Yeah. Okay, because I love that you do the do like a character. He was the one who started me to play in milestones again in public because he loved it so. Not long after he had come into the band, he said that he thought the album Milestones was a def was the definitive jazz album of all time, and that it had the spirit in it of everyone who plays jazz. I was so stunned that I could only say, no shit. <laughs> then he told me that the first music he fell in love with was my music. I just loved him like a son. Tony played to that sound, and he played real hip, slick shit, to the sounds he heard. He changed the way he played every night and played different tempos for every sound every night. Man, to play with Tony Williams, you had to be real alert and pay attention to everything he did or he'd lose you in a second, and you'd just be out of tempo and time and sound real bad. Okay, let me... Let me... All right, here we go. Let me read this last part, all right? The concept for you're under arrest came out of the problems that black people have with policemen everywhere. The police are always fucking with me when I drive around out in California. They didn't like me driving around in a $60,000 yellow Ferrari, which I was doing at the time I made this record. Plus, they didn't like me, a black person, living in a beachfront house in Malibu. That's where the concept for You're Under Arrest came from. Being locked up for being a part of a street scene. Being locked up politically. Being subjected to the looming horror of a nuclear holocaust. Plus, being locked up in a spiritual way. It's the nuclear threat that is really a motherfucker in our daily lives. That and the pollution that is everywhere. Polluted lakes, oceans, rivers, polluted ground, trees, fish, everything. I mean, they're just fucking up everything because they're so fucking greedy. I'm talking about whites who are doing this. And they're doing it all over the world. Fucking up the ozone layer. Threatening to drop bombs on everybody. Trying to always take other people's shit. And sending in armies when people don't want to give up. It's shameful, pitiful, and dangerous what they're doing. What they have been doing all these years, 
because it's fucking with everyone. That's why on Then There Were None, I have a synthesizer creating sounds like flaming, howling winds, which were supposed to be a nuclear explosion. And then you hear my lonely trumpet, which is supposed to be a baby's wailing cry or the sad cry of a person who has survived the bomb's explosion. That's why those bells are there in that tolling, mourning kind of sound. Nice. Okay, this book, I think everybody in show business should read this book. This is Miles. It's the autobiography of Miles Davis. So it's in Miles Davis' own words, and there's a Harper's Index fact about this book that the word motherfucker appears 330 times. 333 times in this book. 333? 333 times the word motherfucker appears. So he'll be talking about, telling a story about Charlie Parker, and then he'll say, and then the motherfucker did this, and then the motherfucker did that. <laughs> so I, I haven't, man, I read this book, Jesus, 30 years ago? What year did this book come out? It's it, not for the faint hearted. Came out in 1989. Wow. It's one of my favorite books of all time. I was born in around 1989. You were 10 years old. <laughs> you born no, seven. don't tell my age on the podcast. Okay, you got one? Yeah. I never read this book. I have this book so long, I never read it. Well, there I go for the first time. Here we go. There's one passion that's profoundly rooted in sexuality and that is inflamed by age. This is jealousy. Lagasse shows that it is often caused by a transference of emotion. The hairdresser, whose business is failing readily, persuades himself that his wife is deceiving him and makes terrible scenes. And since old age is a time of generalized frustration, it begets a general resentment that may take the form of jealousy. Then again, in many old couples, sexual decline often brings with it either one or two-sided resentment, and this easily turns, turns into jealousy. Sometimes in the papers, we read of a 70-year-old man who has beaten or killed the woman he has lived with for, for years out of jealousy, or that he has a fight with a rifle. Maybe he was taking his revenge for his partner's frigidity or for his own impotence. Impotence. Imp impotence. Impotence. Women of over 70 are brought before the courts because they have fought over an aged lover. In institutions where both sexes live together, many violent quarrels break out with jealousy as, as their cause. Dr. Bellier conducted an inquiry in the 13th arrondissement in Paris. They concluded that couples find aging more difficult than solitary individuals because the emotional relations between husband and wife worsen and grow more complex with age. Well, the decline in their health together with the loneliness resulting from retirement and from their children's leaving home means that each lives almost exclusively through the other. More than ever, each demands love and protection and each becomes less and less able to satisfy this demand. Their permanent state of dissatisfaction makes them insist upon always being together. It excites jealousy and even persecution. Separation may indeed be a mortal blow to those who literally cannot do without each other. But living together brings them more torment than happiness. Wow. This is the coming of age, Simone de Beauvoir. Simone de Beauvoir. Wow. And I think you were right. It is impotence. Beauvoir. How do you say it? Uh, oh, Simone de Beauvoir. Beauvoir? That was... Uh, Beauvoir. Sartre's girlfriend, right? Yeah. I think she did a study of, um, you know, getting older. Wow. Yeah. And it's, 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 um, 
Look, it, it, it's worst title. It's a story of coming of age seen from with, within. So she's reporting, you know, how it feels to get older. Wow, shit. Yeah. I should read that. Yeah, a lot of people told me, um, I bought this book when I was 25 or something, that it's, very, it's a very wise book, that you should read it, especially when you're young, you know? But I never read it. But yeah, maybe I should read it now. Wow. Yeah. What are some of the chapters in there? Well, it's, it's more of a report telling more about history. For example, um, what it meant to be old in Rome. Oh, wow. You know, meaning that they, got, they did get respect. You know, they got into politics and all that stuff. Mm. That sounds like a great book. Yeah. And, you know, some statistics and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's it. Okay. You ready for this? Okay. They lighted up a blazing fire, and having rubbed the feet of the criminal with lard and other penetrating and inflammable substances, they stretched him along the ground, with his feet turned towards the fire. In this horrid agony, they forced him to continue, until he had confessed whatever they pleased. These two latter species were usually continued for an hour, and frequently still longer. There were likewise other species of torture frequently made use of, which will be described in the course of the narration. When the accused was condemned to the torture, they conducted him to the place destined for its application, which was called the place of torment. It was a subterraneous vault, the descent to which was by an infinite number of winding passages, in order that the shrieks of the unhappy sufferers should not be heard. In this place there were no seats but such as were destined for the inquisitors, who were always present at the infliction of the torture. It was lighted only by two gloomy lamps, whose dim and mournful light served but to show to the criminal the instruments of torment. One or more executioners attended as the case required. These executioners were clothed nearly in the same manner in which the penitents are dressed, in a large robe of black buckram, their heads and faces concealed under a cowl of the same color, with holes for the eyes and the mouth. The specter-like figure seized the criminal and stripped him of his clothes. Before he was put to the torture, the inquisitor once more exhorted him to confess the crime which he was charged. If he persisted in refusing, that species of torture to which he was condemned was inflicted, being generally one or other of the three kinds which I have mentioned. Sometimes the application was so violent that the strength of the victim entirely sunk under its severity and became necessary to summon the physician of the Inquisition in order to know whether he could endure it longer without his life being endangered. Wow. This Thank fucking you. book, uh, this is History of the Inquisition. It's a tiny book. It's funny. It's like a, it's like a pocket book. Let's see what year this was. I bought this at Eureka Books in Eureka, California. It's funny that somebody would like want to carry this around and read it. Like anywhere you open, <laughs> right. Jesus, look at that! Look at that illustration of the dude being hung upside down. Yeah. Oh my God. Any page you open this to is just fucking really horrible. The shit that's going on. Um, so this is. London, Milner, Milner and Company. Where's the publication year? Shit. I don't know. It's an old book. Well, that wasn't very cheerful. No. Just as the kid was about to get up, the girl bent over and took the last piece of wash from the basket. He watched, and then he sat rooted to the chair. The whole plan went to smash at once. It was a complete fiasco. She was hanging a pair of men's pants on the line. Everything went wrong. Now, wasn't that a nice mess? Of course. She was married, and she and her husband lived in that house, and they were his pants. 
Wonder what kind of a skunk he was. Of all the rotten luck. If she went to the dance, she would dance with her husband. These Spanish girls were pretty straight about things like that. She picked up the empty basket, and with the wind still whipping about her, she went back into the house. Oh, hell. Well, it was a good thing he hadn't gone and told the boys. Wouldn't they have had the horse laugh on him? Those pants were blowing and flapping on the line and hanging upside down by the cuffs with the fly wide open. The kid turned his chair and faced the other way and proceeded to roll another cigarette. Wasn't that rotten luck for you? Married. He puffed furiously on the cigarette. Raging within himself and detergent, determined to take twice as many of John Chisholm's cows as he had originally intended, he sat on the porch and loathed the girl and hated her husband. He must be a skunk, all right, and she probably thought he was fine. The little fool. All girls were fools. He and the gang would be sure to ride tonight, and if anybody tried to stop them, God help him. Nice! Cool. This is Billy the Kid. That's the name of the book. It's about Billy the Kid. Look at that cover, man. That's great. Okay, you ready for the next one? Yes. We get a full-bodied novel of a fabulous young outlaw who splashed the Southwest with blood and violence. That's what it says on the front of the book. By Edwin Corley. Play it on me. Okay. Holding a child by each hand so as not to lose them in a tumult, bumping into acrobats with gold-capped teeth and jugglers with six arms, suffocated by the mingled breath of manicure and sandals that the crowd exhaled. Jose Arcario Buendia went about everywhere like a madman, looking for Melchiades so that he could reveal to him the definitive secrets of that fabulous nightmare. He asked several gypsies who did not understand his language. Finally, he reached the place where Melchiades used to set up his tent, and he found a taciturn Armenian who in Spanish was hawking a syrup to make oneself invisible. He had drunk down a glass of the amber substance in one gulp as José Arcario Buendia elbowed his way through the absorbed group that was witnessing the spectacle and was able to ask his question. The gypsy wrapped him in the frightful climate of his look before he turned into a puddle of pestilential and smoking pitch over which the echo of his reply still floated. Melchiades is dead. Upside, upset by the news, José Arcario Buendia stood motionless, trying to rise above his affliction until the group dispersed, called away by other artifices, and the puddle of the taciturn Armenian evaporated completely. Other gypsies confirmed later on that Melchiades had in fact succumbed to the fever on the beach at Singapore and that his body had been thrown into the deepest part of the Java Sea. The children had no interest in the news. They insisted that their father take them to see the overwhelming novelty of the surges of Memphis that was being advertised at the entrance of a tent that, according to what was said, had belonged to King Solomon. They insisted so much that José Arcadio Buendia paid the 30 reales and led them into the center of the tent where there was a giant with a hairy torso and a shaved head with a copper ring in his nose and a heavy iron chain on his ankle watching over a pirate chest. When it was opened by the giant, the chest gave off a glacial exhalation. Inside there was only an enormous transparent block with infinitive internal needles in which the light of the sunset was broken up into colored stars. Disconcerted, knowing that the children were waiting for an immediate explanation, José Arcadio Buendia ventured a murmur. It's the largest diamond in the world! No, the gypsy countered. It's ice. José Arcadio Buendia 
without understanding, stretched out his hand toward the cake, but the giant moved it away. Five reals more to touch it, he said. Jose Arcario Buendia paid them and put his hand on the ice and held it there for several minutes as his heart teary. Oh, sorry. <laughs> as his heart filled with fear and jubilation at the contact with mystery. Without knowing what to say, he paid ten reals more so that his sons could have that prodigious experience. Little Jose Arcadio refused to touch it. Aureliano, on the other hand, took a step forward and put his hand on it, withdrawing it immediately. It's boiling, he exclaimed, startled. But his father paid no attention to him. Intoxicated by the evidence of the miracle, he forgot at that moment about the frustration of his delirious undertakings and Milkiada's body, abandoned to the appetite of the squids. He paid another five reals and with his hands on the cake, as if giving testimony on the holy scriptures, he exclaimed, This is the great invention of our time. Wow. Nice, huh? What is that? 100 Years of Solitude, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Wow, I paid money to touch the diamond. <laughs> I love this book. Intoxicated by the evidence of the miracle. He writes so beautiful, beautiful. doesn't he? Yeah. Okay, you ready for this? You have to read this book. I, it's, I started to read that years ago, and then um, I petered out after 20 or 30 pages. I need to give that another shot. Because it's considered one of the greatest novels of mm -hmm. all time. Okay. What book is this? Oh, damn, I wish that I were dead. Absolutely non-existent. Gone away from here. From everywhere, but how would I do it? There is always bridges. The Brooklyn Bridge. But I love that bridge. Everything is beautiful from there, and the air is so clean. Walking, it seems peaceful even with all those cars going crazy underneath. So it would have to be some other bridge, an ugly one, with no view. Except, I like in particular, all bridges. There is something about them. And besides, i never seen an ugly bridge. This is the straight from the diary of Marilyn Monroe. Wow, Marilyn Monroe never saw an ugly bridge. But do you get it? She wanted to um, commit suicide. And she couldn't do it on a Brooklyn Bridge because she found it too beautiful. Ah. And she said, I should find another bridge with no view, an ugly bridge. Wow. That's interesting. Um, where did we get that book? I remember we bought that somewhere. I got it. You got that. It's a beautiful book. It's called Fragments. It's fragmented poems from... Uh, from Marilyn Monroe's Diaries. Yeah. Wow. Okay, you ready for this? Time for a poem. Dying Laughing. A lover was telling his beloved how much he loved her, how faithful he had been, how self-sacrificing, getting up at dawn every morning, fasting, giving up wealth and strength and fame, all for her. There was a fire in him. He didn't know where it came from, but it made him weep and melt like a candle. You've done well, she said. But listen to me. All this is the decor of love. The branches and leaves and blossoms. You must live at the root to be a true lover. What is that? Tell me. You've done the outward acts, but you haven't died. You must die. When he heard that, he laid back on the ground, laughing, and died. He opened like a rose that drops to the ground and died laughing. That laughter was his freedom and his gift to the eternal. As moonlight shines back at the sun, he heard the call to come home and went. When light returns to its source, it takes nothing of what it has illuminated. It may have shown on a garbage dump or a garden or in the center of a human eye. No matter, it goes, and when it does, the open plain becomes passionately desolate, wanting it back. 
Okay. Cool. How about one more? Flowering gifts. It takes too long to tell the whole story of these stories. Back to the debtor who was praying at the this master's grave and the court bailiff who heard him, who also loved the master, and who then took him home and gave him a hundred dinars and fed him roast meat and told him stories. So that the roses began to open in the debtor's chest, the way it happens when prosperity comes after a long time of not having much. Midnight, and they were still up talking. Then sleep took them to the meadow where the spirit feeds, and that night the bailiff dreamed that he saw the master. My excellent bailiff, I see what you've done, and I hear how you're talking, but in the spirit we must keep silent. The unseen cannot be told. Otherwise, your mortality, meat, would not get cooked as it should. You would stay half raw. Here in the spirit we can see the final results of what we did in the material world. What comes of our generosities is especially beautiful. Now listen to the gifts I have for our new friend, the man who owes so much money. I knew he would come to be here with you, so I packed some jewels away for him. He owes 9,000 gold pieces. These are more than enough for that. They're in a jar with his name on it buried in a vault. I'll show you where. Before I died, I wrote this down in a little notebook, and I meant to give it to him, but death took me. There are rubies and pearls and topazes, a great fortune. If he says he doesn't need that much, let him give it to whoever he wants to. Milk never returns to the breast. It keeps flowing out. Muhammad said that anybody who takes a gift back is like, an, is like a dog licking its vomit. Two years ago, I hid this wealth, and it is only for him to dispense. It must go through him to those it's supposed to reach. The master told two other mysteries to the bailiff, but I cannot reveal those. Some secrets must be kept. And besides, this Mathnawi has to stay within some limits. The bailiff woke, happier than he'd ever been, snapping his fingers, singing love songs, then sad songs, all kinds of songs. The debtor, his guest, said, What did you dream of that you woke so drunken? You woke without any boundaries. The city cannot hold you, nor can the desert. Not even your circle of friends can hold you today. You're free. I saw the master. I saw the giver. The bailiff rambled on, singing and talking. He lay down on his back, laughing and babbling in the middle of his room. With a crowd of people around him, he told the debtor everything. Wow. Nice. This book is called Delicious Laughter by Rumi. Rumi was the Sufi mystic poet from Iran. Yeah. Way to go, Rumi. Okay. March 8th, 1971. The day of the Ali Frazier fight. In about two hours, Ali will be in the ring and tangling with Joe Frazier. Even in the dressing room, the traditional precautions are tougher. The police many times more numerous. Yet, as I make notes in my pad, this room is full of people. Worse, we are waiting for television cameras to come in now. And television sports broadcaster Howard Cosell is waiting for the engineers to start his interview. Normally, I understand what a fighter feels when he's waiting for his zero hour to arrive. But each fighter has his own particular way of dealing with fear. Floyd Patterson used to walk into dressing rooms... And as soon as he sat on the massage table, began to yawn. Minutes after talk, taking his clothes off, he would fall asleep, and he would wake up until the and he and he wouldn't wake up until the man from the commission would wake him to get him ready. A good fight, a good club fighter, Eddie Gavin used to sit down, get up, sit down again. I, us, I usually walked into the dressing room making jokes. 
but nothing would make him laugh. I used to laugh because I knew what he was going through. The dressing room is more than the silence before the storm. It is the symptoms before the illness, or worst of all, like the last minutes in death row. Certainly for middleweight contender Wilbert Skeeter McClure, a dressing room was death row, and he was a prisoner who didn't fear anything but death. He was impossible. He was a good fighter, but he never learned how to control fear. That was one lie he never learned. My life in dressing rooms was not much different from the others. I felt what Floyd, Gavin, and McClure felt, but no one would suspect. I hid my emotions pretty well. Cool. This is uh, from a book called Sting Like a Bee. Ha ha. The Muhammad Ali story. Ice cubes cracked downstairs as Derek dropped them into the drinks and said, Karen's around somewhere. I'm sure she'll pop up in a minute. Karen went softly, softly up the remaining stairs and into Anne's room. There were the tumbled clothes on the bed and a wedding dress, again wrapped up in its sheet, lying on top of them. She took off her shorts and her shirt and her shoes and began the desperate, difficult process of getting into this dress. Instead of trying to put it over her head, she wriggled her way up into it, through the crackling skirt and lace bodice. She got her arms into the sleeves, being careful not to snag the lace with her fingernail. Her fingernails were mostly too short to be a problem, but she was careful anyway. She pulled the lace points over her hands. Then she did up all the hooks at the waist. The hardest thing was to do the hooks at the back of the neck. She bent her head and hunched her shoulders, trying to make those hooks easier to get at. Even so, she had a disaster the lace ripping a little under one arm. That shocked her and even made her stop for a second. But it seemed she had gone too far to give up now, and she, get, and she got the rest of the hooks fastened without mishap. She could seal up that tear when she got her dress off, or she could lie and claim that she had noticed it before she had put the dress on, and might not see it anyway. Now the veal... She had to be very careful with the veal. Any tear would show. She shook it all out and tried to secure it with a branch of apple blossoms, just as Anne had done. But she couldn't get the branch to bend properly or the slippery pins to hold it. She thought it might be better to tie the whole thing on with a ribbon or a sash. She went to Anne's closet to see if she could find something. And there hung a man's tie rack, a man's ties. Derek's ties, though she never had seen him wearing a tie. She pulled up a striped tie, a striped tie off the rack, and tried it around her forehead, tying it at the back of her head, holding the veal firmly in place. She did this in front of the mirror, and when it was done, she saw that she had created a gypsy effect, a flaunting comic effect. An idea came to her, which forced her to undo. With strenuous effort, all those hooks and eyes, then pat the front of the dress with tightly wetted up clothing from Anne's bed. She filled and overfilled the lace that had hung limp, being fashioned for Anne's breasts. Better this way, better to make them laugh. She could not then get all the hooks done up afterwards, but she got enough to hold the clownish cloth bosom in place. She got the neck band fastened as well. She was sweating all over when she finished. Anne didn't wear lipstick or eye makeup, but on the top of the dresser there was, surprisingly, a pot of hardened rouge. Karen spat in it and rubbed round plotches on her cheeks. Wow. Do you like the writing? Yeah, what book is that? It's Alice Munro. What's the name of the book? The Love of a Good Woman. They're short stories. Wow. Those apple blossoms. She, you know, she's a winner of a Pulitzer Prize. For that book? Oh, a Nobel Prize. Sorry. Yeah. Nobel Prize for Literature in 2013. Wow. Okay. Five years ago. Alice Munro. The Love Alice of a Monroe. Good Woman.
Okay, here's my next selection. The artist is an exception. His idleness is work. And his work, repose. He is elegant and slovenly in turn. He dones, as he pleases, the plowman's overalls and determines the tales worn by the man in fashion. He is not subject to laws. He imposes them. Whether he occupies himself by doing nothing or ponders over a masterpiece without appearing busy. Whether he leads a horse with a wooden bit or leads with long reins the four horses of Britska. Whether he lacks even 25 cents or throws around handfuls of gold, he is always the expression of a great thought and towers over society. Wow. This is from Treatise on Elegant Living by Honoré de Balzac. The goal of the civilized man, as of the savage, is repose. Okay. The man accustomed to work cannot understand elegant living. <laughs> okay, you about ready to wrap up this game? Yes. Why don't you read um, one more, and then uh, which one would you like? Here we go. This is not a novel, is it? No, no, no. Here, why don't you read this one? Chapter 7. The Man's Side. How to Win a Woman. I am now going to take the case of a man who falls violently in love with a girl, Sally, we will call her. She seems not particularly taken with him, but not absolutely indifferent. And he is the seeker and she the salt. It is he, this time, who will be most likely to lose his head and make mistakes. So he had better listen very carefully to what I am going to tell him. <laughs> he must begin, as Celia began about Henry, by studying what are her likes and dislikes, so as not to go completely contrary to them. Sally is not an especially wayward girl, but she is nice looking, we will say, and has a fair amount of admiration in her 23 years. She knows men quite well and has a constant series of flirtations like every other girl of his acquaintance. But something in her drew him immediately he has quite enough money to marry her, so he can begin his courting pour le bon motif, as the French say. But if the sudden attraction is very strong, he would do well to ascertain a few things about Sally before the passion has become overmastering and he is no longer able to use judgment in the affair, but to plunge in blindfold. He had better find out about her family and her bringing up, and if they are unsatisfactory, he had better study the point of what effect they have I had up on her. If no bad one, they ought not to be considered, but if they are such that they would destroy all chance of future happiness, he had better retire as soon as he can get out of the radius of Sally's influence upon him, unless he is of a, such a strong character that he feels he can remove him from her family and control or eliminate their bad effect upon her. This is so funny. Should I go on? It's very long. Uh, what are you... Do? It's great. I love it. Okay. It's an old book. A young man should be very sure that it is the special woman who is drawing him strongly and that he is not just imagining that, he, that she is his heart desire because he himself is experiencing the desire to love. To make your own examination of your own emotions, Richard... When you first fall in love with some girl that is first experienced that drawing sensation which makes you desire to be near her and causes your heart to beat and gives you a sense of exaltation. Do ask yourself if she is appealing to your mind or your soul. Whether you feel degraded or uplifted in spirit after you have spent time with her. Because if it is only the physical, she is appealing to you. You have not much chance of future happiness with her, and you had better crush the feeling before it has gone too far and landed you in a morass. I love it. It's funny. Nice. So, okay, what's the book? <clears throat> the Philosophy of Love, Eleanor Glynn. Can you open the, the beginning and see what year that is? 
Uh, I bought that book in a used bookstore just because of the title. It is the year of the 1923. Wow. In Great Britain and Ireland. Yeah, I may have bought that in, um, in Ireland. It's funny. I like it. Okay, so let's, uh, let's wrap up the book game, huh? The last one. Last one. So, okay, so I want to end strong, so I grabbed this book. Um, Rumi is considered one of the greatest poets of all time, but this guy is also from Iran. He was also a Sufi mystic poet, Hafiz, and this book is called I Heard God Laughing. Okay, so... This is the book where he says, I, I want to make your body my prayer carpet. Tripping over joy. What is the difference between your experience of existence and that of a saint? The saint knows that the spiritual path is a sublime chess game with God and that the beloved has just made such a fantastic move. That the saint is now continually tripping over joy and bursting out in laughter, and saying, I surrender, whereas, my dear, I am afraid you still think you have a thousand serious moves. Nice. Nice. Okay, one more. I love that he says, I am happy even before I have a reason. Okay, this is called laughter. What is laughter? What is laughter? It is God waking up. Oh, it is God waking up. It is the sun poking its sweet head out from behind a cloud. You have been carrying too long, veiling your eyes and heart. It is light breaking ground for a great structure. That is your real body called truth. It is happiness applauding itself and then taking flight to embrace everyone and everything in this world. Laughter is the pole star. Held in the sky by our beloved, who eternally says, Yes, dear ones, come this way. Come this way towards me and love. Come with your tender mouths moving and your beautiful tongues conducting songs. And with your movements, your magic movements of hands and feet and glands and cells dancing. Know that to God's eye, all movement is a wondrous language. And music, such exquisite, wild music. Oh, what is laughter, Hafiz? What is this precious love and laughter budding in our hearts? It is the glorious sound of a soul waking up. Oh, I love this one. We did it. We did it. So, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Okay, shit, I'm... No, that was a great ending, babe. Okay. <laughs> hey, so that is our book game. I hope you enjoyed it. That... This was Book Roulette. This was Book Roulette, where we randomly grab a book off the shelf and read it to you. And, of course, you know, there was a few that I couldn't help um, grabbing, like Rumi and Hafiz. I hope it inspires you to read some books. Yay! Read anything. Read a gum wrapper. Read a Dixie cup. Um, just read something. Read the medicine prescription. As Thomas Jefferson said, I cannot live without books. Shalom, amigos. Shalom, amigas. Yo, Mac, I don't even understand how they didn't understand you and that Mary Joy. Yeah, I Kick know, Kick that man. old robotic, futuristic George Jetson. Yeah, crazy well, Joy. Just ah. like you the blab. Robotic kick and flab. A flavor bit of batter to the chatter. Matter than the mad hatter. I bet your boss come my fatter. I got the data to turn your body into anti-matter. And just like a piece of sizzling, you'll fit inside my stomach with the eggs and grits between. The king is what I mean. I mean, my man, get a cup and put some change inside your hand. Now hold up. Let's make this official. Everybody, let's agree that MCs need a tissue. The folks, my only issue. I bet your mama miss you, and I bet the Mac take off like an MX missile. No more of your whining on the charts climbing as I make the funk kick it out more harder than a diamond. And if you didn't know who's rhyming, I guess I'm gonna say Craig Mac with perfect timing. You won't be around next year, my rap's too severe, kicking my flavor in your head.
comes a brand new flavor in your ear. Time for new flavor in your ear. I'm kicking new flavor in your ear. Back to brand new flavor in your ear. Craig Mack, 1,000 degrees. You'll be on your knees and you'll be burning, begging, please. Brother Freeze, man's in the and deep rooted folks smoke that leaves your brains booted. This bad MC with stamina like Bruce Jenner, the winner takes an MCs for dinner. You're crazy like crazy. that glue. I think that you could outdo my one two. That's sick like the flu. Shake them down, boy. I flip, boy, all the time. Ah, Cause boy, the rhyme to kick and ain't worth a dime. Seems like there's no competition in this rap world expedition. You come around and knock you out position. Knock them out. No flame you could ever dig a grave. Both the Mac, the power pack, and black make you see make crap. And here comes a brand new flavor in your ear. Max, a brand new flavor in your ear. Here comes a brand new flavor in your ear. Time for new flavor in your ear. I'm kicking new flavor in your ear. Max, a brand new flavor in your ear. Here comes a brand new flavor in your ear. Time for new flavor in your ear. I'm kicking new flavor in your ear. Max, a brand new flavor in your ear. Ha! Max, go with more hope than the Pope. For MCs, more knots than rope. I'd like to break it down, down, breaking, forsaking laws of MC shaking with this track that my man's making. MCs will run like a bomb threat. I bet, what? or better yet, uh, make you sweat, getting hotter than the sun get. Yeah. Craig Mac is the play that bumps from here to Tibet. I break all rules with my action. That the max into MC, stop relaxing. This brand new sheriff that's in town, just getting down, leaving bodies buried in the ground. I set up rhymes for a decoy down for bad boy. Watch the M's not destroy. And here comes the brand new flavor.